Hello everyone and welcome, it's Federico. Today we'll be continuing our Geometric Deep Learning adventure talking about a very interesting topic and this is the connection between transformers, so a very important uh, model uh, which um, has revolutionized the field and uh, graph attention network. So this is the model we, we went over in, in the previous episode and you can treat this as this episode as more kind of a, a very interesting uh, relationship between the two models. So. Um, let's start with the, actually the context in which uh, transformers were born in and this is a really like neural machine translation so the task of, of taking a sentence like the cat uh, is uh, and so on and then translating it into another language for example in Italian it would be il gatto è uh, and, and so on right so uh, in, in, in this context, what we want to do is translate between different languages and, and do this with a neural network. And we st usually what we do is, well, what we can do is, is, first of all, embed each word into a vector. So we could embed the into a vector, cat into a vector, is into a vector, and so on. And what we want to do is, uh, first of all, compute some kind of latent representations for these. Uh, this is kind of the encoding step and then decode them into a sentence, right? So, so one of the main models, uh, especially back in, in kind of a, when neural machine translation started to kind of flourish with, with neural networks was called the recurrent neural network. And the recurrent neural network, uh, pretty much if you want to compute some H, uh, HT, let's say. So uh, what you do is you have some kind of neural network and to H, uh, you, you feed it HT minus one and XT, right? So one way you could visualize this is you, you would have like your, your X1, so this would be like the embedding of the, uh, you would pass it through your, your neural network F, uh, and then this, um, this would produce some H1, right? But now, when you, when you do the next step, um, you, your neural network F would take both this H1 and x2 right so in some sense to produce h2 right and in in some sense um you can kind of continue this but you are instead of treating these xi's in in, in isolation you are you are leveraging the structure which is imposed by the sentence so a sentence is is a sequence so it's a set with with some kind of ordering right and um and with this process, you, you are really trying to say that, well, uh, you are reading left to right and then saying that, like, th there's this kind of chronological order in the tokens of, of, of the sequence, right? And this is nice. I mean, it's, it's, it works very well, but it does have some drawbacks. So some kind of important drawbacks are, well, it's, uh, I mean... Uh, other than like its training stability issues, but but uh, one uh, like with the gradients vanishing and so on. So one drawback of this um, of of this method is like let's say you have a very long sequence. So you have um, your xn here, and and there's kind of a lot of lot of tokens between them. Now since you you are kind of uh, passing information along with your h. Uh, with your this kind of latent vector h what happens is that well this vector is finite size and you're trying to put like maybe as a, a number of, of 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 tokens inside of it that that's much bigger than than the than the dimensionality of this vector right so you're, you're trying to, let's say your vector has a d is d dimensional it has i don't know 100 dimensions but your sequence is a thousand dimensional or it has a thousand uh, elements then you're trying to fit a thousand uh, kind of vectors into a which themselves might be high dimensional into a only 100 right so, so this is known as over squashing right and um and effectively what happens is that you, you tend to lose information that happened uh, a lot of time ago, right? So, so in, in some sense, this was the motivation uh, of transformers along others is that, well, now instead of treating this as a sequence where you go from left to right, right? Also, like this is kind of a very strong assumption that words to your left are very kind of uh, important for your task, right? Uh, well, instead, let's treat this as a set, right? And let's simply have a neural network decide which which elements of the set are the most important to produce your, your latent embedding, right? So if you want to produce your HI, you make it depend on all of the elements in the, in the set and you want to kind of make the neural network decide which elements to pick off that are most uh, relevant for the each uh, HI. Of course, this, this is the intuition that uh, if you have different words, the, the, 
like different words will have different impacts on different words right and 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 you won't know uh, you know in general which ones will be the most impactful right like this is actually like you you would have solved the task in some sense if you already knew this and um and this is kind of what it looks like you have uh, i mean there's some terminology here with the query key and value uh, I personally don't like so much this terminology, but uh, anyway, so your query and key are what are used to compute the attention weights. So it's these WIJs with the softmax. So these are a, effectively a probability, a different probability mass function for each word, uh, which depends on your XI. And then you, you kind of go through each J, right? So so if you have like the, and then you pretty much compute a PMF over the, the cat, like the whole sentence. And then for cat, you'd have a different PMF. For is, you'd have a different PMF and so on and then what you do is well for this kind of for each word you you're weighing it for, with this attention coefficient right now this may well this hopefully rings a, a a big bell in your head well this is exactly what a graph attention network does i mean okay maybe transformers have extra bells and whistles like positional encodings and, and and layer norms and so on i mean it's but these are used in in graph neural networks as well but um the main idea is effectively here in transform is what you have. Uh, this is kind of the, the main kind of relationship is that in the, the, the adjacency matrix of a transformer looks something like this. So one, it's a matrix of all ones, right? And effectively, it's like saying that your your um, your x1 uh, to xn, right? Th this is kind of like a graph, right? So let me just draw it for for um, for maybe two or let's say for, for four for four vectors right so it's like having a graph where each element is now connected to um uh, to every element right so so this is like a, a big clique right and and you you can start to think about why why this may be problematic um well uh, or what may be also the advantages of this so first of all the, the most obvious problem is that in transformer this scales quadratically with the number of terms, right? Because you have a fully connected graph. In 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 so so GATS in some sense, tr transformers are a special case of graph attention networks where the um the the graph is fully connected, right? And and GATS in some sense are more efficient because they are able to work with with potentially much sparser graphs, which means you have in practice much less than than quadratic number of of, of edges. Um, and uh, yeah, also like you can imagine that if you have very long sequences, right? This this attention you you are still restricted to a probability mass function. So if you have like like a, a lot of sequences, imagine one sequence has like probability 0.8. Uh, but then this means that like all, all the rest of like the terms they still have to kind of sum up to to 0.2, right? So so this creates some kind of like a lot of like an instability in this process, right? Because uh, if you if you're kind of going all in into a word, then then all the other words will kind of vanish, and and, and this this makes it very hard to train. I mean, I think I I'm not like an expert in transformers by any means, but like my understanding is that like a lot of work is going into like how can you train these massive transformers to still work, right? And and to to train them uh, that every time you're able to train them somewhat successfully, right? So. This is an extremely interesting connection, my idea, and in in my opinion, and and I hope that uh, that you kind of enjoy the learning about this, and uh, yeah, so uh, we'll continue the next time. With I still have to choose a topic, but uh, I'll see, and um, yeah, hope I see, hope to see you in the next episode. Bye.